Well, good evening, everyone. We're delighted to have you with us. Welcome to Book Talk Tuesday. My name is Jim Ambusky of the Center for Digital History at the Washington Library. Happy New Year to you all. We're glad to see you back in this new year and delighted that you've joined and decided to spend your evening with us. Tonight, I'm very excited because we're gonna have an opportunity to explore the challenges, the stresses, the opportunities that early Americans faced while living under British military rule in the American Revolution. Before we get to that, and before we get to our distinguished guests this evening, just a programming note, I wanna encourage you all to join us on January the 27th, so next week, when we'll have a special symposium entitled Leadership for a More Perfect Union. Now, this is a, a symposium. It's a, it's a one-day symposium done in partnership with the Brookings Institute. We're gonna be talking about some of the serious issues that are facing this country at this time and some of the solutions for the way forward. We'll be joined by some esteemed figures from uh, government from philanthropy and from business, including former Secretary of State Colin Powell, current Governor of Maryland Larry Hogan, and current Associate Justice of the Supreme Court Sonia Sotomayor. So please go to mountvernon.org, check us out there where you can register for this free event. We encourage you to join us in these important discussions, and uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Um, I also want to encourage you to help support Mount Vernon and other public history sites over this difficult time. But we were delighted to bring programming like this to you free every so often, uh, but that does come with a cost. So if you are able and you have uh, some means to do so, we'd appreciate you throwing a few clams our way uh, right now. And you can find a way to do that by going to mountvernon.org and clicking that donate button. All right, let's talk about tonight's main topic. In 1815, as many of you might know, John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson and he argued that the revolution was in the hearts and minds of the people in the 15 years before a drop of blood was spilt at Lexington and Concord. And he also argued that the war for independence and the revolution were two different things. But were they really? And that's one of the things that we're gonna to explore tonight and many other questions as well. Our guest this evening is Dr. Donald F. Johnson. He's an assistant professor at North Dakota State University. He's a former Washington Library Research Fellow, and he is the author of a brand new book, Occupied America, British Military Rule, and the Experience of Revolution, published in 2020 by University of Pennsylvania Press. If you'd like to purchase a copy of that, we'll drop a link in the comments at this time. It is my uh, distinct privilege to welcome Dr. Johnson to the screen. Hello there, sir. Hi, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's a great honor. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I am, am I correct in assuming that you are coming to us from uh, Fargo this evening? I am, yes. I have to ask, what's the temperature there right now? Uh, I haven't checked lately, but uh, this morning when I drove to work, it was about five degrees above. Uh, so, um, yeah, a little nippy. Yeah, look, and do you have a heated garage, as I understand many uh, people do in that part of the world? Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, Don, thanks very much. I'm, I'm really excited uh, to talk with you about this book. I, I was really fascinated by your findings and uh, your discussion of the experience that people faced during the occupation, during the Revolutionary War. I want to start with a big picture question, though. Uh, a lot of our colleagues in the historical profession have been writing a lot these days about American loyalists. They've been writing a lot about the ordinary Americans uh, during the Revolution, looking at you know, the plight of women, uh, uh, slaves who were escaping to British lines and pursuing freedom. What was missing? What did you think was missing from that conversation? Well, I think uh, specifically from the question of, of loyalists and patriots, uh, what's missing is kind of the people who wouldn't have identified as either mm -hmm. uh, or who could have identified as both at various points throughout the war. I mean, there's this whole category and people have called it different things like neutrals or uh, like Aaron Sullivan's recent book uh, called them the disaffected. Mm -hmm. um, these people who uh, at certain points side with the crown, at certain points side with the revolutionaries, at certain points side with neither. Uh, um, and I felt like those types of people, first of all, weren't well served in this kind of categorization that we have of patriots on one side, loyalists on the other. Um, and it's it that it was a much more kind of complicated story that there was there had to be there has to be room for change over time for people's loyalties to be to be much more complicated, much more inflected by their their day to day existence. Mm 
Um, and in terms of the, the everyday experiences of women, of enslaved people, of Native Americans, you know, there there has been a ton of uh, great uh, uh, history on that um, written in the last uh, decade or so. Um, but I felt that it, it, you know, it takes the exceptional, right? It takes these these kind of um, disenfranchised kind of um, groups, uh, but it doesn't integrate their stories into a, a more coherent narrative. Um, you know, it doesn't integrate it with, uh, with with what kind of everyone else is doing. Um, and so I was trying to get at uh, kind of ordinary people of different races, genders, backgrounds, um, and get at kind of how the ordinary experience of revolution really shaped political allegiance. I'm curious then how our early ancestors and, and the ancestors being uh, our predecessors in the historical profession shaped this narrative early on. Uh, because you said we've always been, we've been accustomed to thinking of, of two categories, patriots and loyalists, and these people in the middle, this gray area sort of get lost in between. But very early on in the immediate aftermath of the war, I gather, people who started writing the histories of the war uh, made those kind of determinations, helped shape the story we were telling even up until recently. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, two of the, the earliest historians of the, the war were actually ones that were involved in military occupation themselves, uh, Mercy Otis Warren and uh, David Ramsey. Um, and they they knew well, you know, uh, Ramsey writes uh, the history of the Revolution of South Carolina in 1785. Uh, Warren publishes her uh, multi-volume history of the Amer uh, rise, progress, and termination of the American Revolution uh, in the first decade of the 19th century. Ramsey himself, um, you know, was a prisoner of war in occupied Charleston. Uh, Warren was uh, witness to a lot of the, the trials and tribulations of occupied Boston and, and Newport. Um, they knew they would have known well from their personal experience kind of the ambiguities, the nuances of allegiance uh, during this period. But it was in their interest as kind of the, the ruling elite of the new republic after the war um, not to cast the, the struggle itself like that. I mean, it, it's kind of like that Adams quote that you, uh, you, you opened with. Adams writes that, um, you know, something like, I'm going to butcher it here, but that the, uh, uh, the revolution was complete, you know, before the first shot was fired, that, that um, everyone had turned against the British, um, you know, well before the war, and that the war was an after effect of this, this kind of change in people's minds. Um, and people like Ramsey and Warren, you know, it was in their interest to create this narrative of a patriotic kind of revolutionary cadre to which people could cling um, and to which people whose own experiences didn't necessarily uh, uh, fit that uh, could then claim after the war and say, oh, I was always a patriot or I was always kind of, you know, on this side. Um, and it's interesting kind of in reading their histories, one of the things that I found in, in kind of going back through you know, with an eye towards how they're defining loyalty and political allegiance uh, is actually how very few loyalists they actually name outright. Um, you know, many times they, they the people that they name are either notorious loyalists, um, people like Joseph Galloway uh, or the Allen brothers of Philadelphia um, who have already fled uh, the United States um, or else they're kind of this incohate group of, of kind of, you know, the loyalists, uh, mm -hmm. but never kind of with an actual definition um, and how far they kind of bend over backwards to kind of forgive people who kind of strayed at certain points from, from what they see as kind of this patriot path. No, is it your sense then that they're doing that because after the war there is attempts at reconciliation uh, in, in both places, well, all across in the 13 colonies turned states? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that, um, you know, even some of the, the kind of higher profile founding fathers are, are involved with um, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton. Um, you know, a lot of these figures in New York uh, are making the argument that you can't really alienate some of these these people who sided with the crown early on in the war um, because they are contributing uh, a good deal to society. They have money, they have expertise, they have the tools that, that uh, 
people need to build a nation. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if if you're going to have kind of this strict, like if you did anything to support the crown during the war, you cannot be part of the American polity, then you're going to have to exclude, um, you know, one historian's estimated half a million people either yeah. Uh, served in uh, served in arms for the crown, you know, spoke in support of the crown, or took some action, um, you know, that that could be construed as loyalists. So if you're going to exclude that many people, um, you know, that's a quarter of of you know the population at least. Yeah, that can get awkward pretty fast. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to take this opportunity to remind the audience that you'll have a chance to ask questions of Dr. Johnson in the second half of the program. So please do post your questions in the comments on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, wherever you're watching with us this evening. Uh, Don, just a second ago, you, you actually mentioned Boston, Newport, Charleston. Your book does look at port cities uh, exclusively. <laughs> Why port cities? What do we get from these urban spaces that we, we're not gonna get from the hinterlands or the, the back country? So I looked at urban spaces uh, for two reasons. First, um, records are more likely to survive from these, these places um, and in greater concentration um, than in, in kind of the hinterlands. Um, and so this was where kind of the sources that spoke to the experience of military occupation uh, really existed and, and, and survived. Um, and second, it's a place, the other places where occupation was the most intense and um, had the highest stakes. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of intensity, the, uh, the British occupied vast swaths uh, uh, elsewhere in America, in rural America, um, you know, pretty much the entire state of Georgia, the entire state of South Carolina at various points, uh, most of New Jersey, large parts of New York and, um, and Pennsylvania. Uh, but in the countryside, in, in places that were, you know, ostensibly controlled or occupied by the British, uh, ordinary people might go months or weeks without even seeing a single British soldier. Uh, whereas in cities where people are really kind of living cheek by jowl, um, you know, you're, you're interacting with the occupying force every single day and um, the uh, things move much more quickly and, and with a greater intensity. Uh, and then in terms of the stakes, um, the cities were crucial to kind of the, the plan on both sides. Um, for the British, the, the strategy was, was kind of to take the cities and use them as bases to uh, conciliate loyalty from the surrounding countryside. Um, and if there was anywhere that would be welcoming of the British army, it was likely to be these port cities, which were much more cosmopolitan, um, much more kind of transient in their population, and who had largely depended on trade with the rest of the British Empire uh, for their livelihoods uh, before the revolution. And, and in many places, for example, um, Newport, Rhode Island welcomes the British army with, with kind of a, uh, a council of their um, higher citizens uh, mm -hmm reading a proclamation of greeting to Sir Henry Clinton when he lands. Um, you know, so, so in a lot of these places, there were kind of people who uh, welcomed the chance to get back to business uh, when the British arrived. Um, but over the course of the war, they, they kind of realized that um, the cost of having soldiers quartered there and the experience of occupation um, made them realize that the, uh, the the empire wasn't kind of a place to go back to. Well, I want to come back to the British occupation in a second, but one of the things that really struck me about your book and made me think about things in different ways was the extent to which the revolutionary regimes that rise and come into, into being in the, the immediate months or the early months of the war were themselves a kind of occupying force. Uh, what what did they, what, you know? What do these rebel governments look like, and what? Uh, how did the people respond to them when when this dramatic change occurs in seventy five seventy six? Yeah, a lot of people really didn't know what to make of them. Um, you know, they they were these groups of um, citizens that formed themselves into committees, councils, militias, uh, kind of resistance organizations, and. Um, starting around April of 1775, after the battles of Lexington and Concord, um, they started kind of seizing the apparatuses of power. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the six cities that, uh, that I'm looking at here in the book um, were each capitals of their respective colonies. 
Uh, and in order to obtain kind of legitimacy and the, the sanction of, of a proper government, revolutionaries made moves almost immediately to kind of secure those, those places, secure the records, secure the uh, apparatus of, uh, of civil government. Mm -hmm. um, and this took place, you know, almost kind of some, in somewhat of a, of a comical way. Um, you know, one of the, the um, my favorite examples happened in um, Savannah, Georgia, where the, uh, the clerk of the King's Council in Savannah, uh, the, basically the person in charge of record keeping at the uh, colony house in Savannah, uh, gets woken up at six in the morning by uh, one of his neighbors saying, you know, hey, the, the um, Provincial Congress, this revolutionary organization, uh, we broke into the courthouse. We want the keys to your office so we can get the colonial records. Uh, <laughs> he basically says, you know, no, I'm not going to give you the keys. Uh, so they come back a couple of hours later and they threaten his wife and they and they say, basically, we're going to rough you up if you don't let us in and, and give us the colonial records. Um, and he still says, no, I'm not going to give you the keys to my office. Uh, and they come back a couple hours later and they say, all right, we broke into your office. We can't make heads or tails of the records. Will you at least come and show us what's what? Um, and he says, yeah, well, all right, if you're already broken in, I'll, I'll go and, you know, at least you're not going to make a mess of it. Um, and they let him kind of organize the records for them and take anything that, that is private, you know, for him and, and, uh, and go, uh, you know, go about his way. Um, but it's, it's this kind of, you know, uh, uh soft occupation almost this, this, yeah. Um, seizing of, of public buildings and, and records and, and the auspices of power uh, at the beginning of the revolution. So when we then have a hard occupation, then when the British take New York or Newport or Savannah, Charleston, these other cities, Boston, Philadelphia, what, uh, what does that look like? You had mentioned a moment ago that one of their goals was to conciliate the American colonists back to the crown and to the king's government. What does that process look like? And, and what's the role of uh, collaborators, I guess, would be the word in this process? Yeah, and I mean, uh, uh, collaborators is a great word. I, I use it in the book in the sense that um, historians of the French um, uh, occupier, the Britain, German occupation of France use it, um, in that comma, almost everybody living under occupation collaborates to some degree or, or another. Um, but what the British do is um, pretty much immediately when they land and, and they retake um, these, uh, these cities, starting with New York and then Newport, um, Philadelphia, uh, Savannah, and Charleston, um, they start distributing loyalty oaths. Um, and they, uh, they go around and they first do this in New York in uh, the fall of 1776. Mm -hmm. um, and they get, uh, they get people to sign these, these loyalty oaths. And I think I've been there. There it is. Um, you guys are ahead of me. Um, but they, uh, they, they, they give out these, these things that basically these little slips of paper um, that are held in, in duplicate. One of them is, um, you know, in a book that is held at government, the uh, military headquarters. And one of them is um, given to the person who signs them. Um, that has them kind of renounce any loyalties to the revolutionaries, sign over their loyalties to the crown. Um, in some cases, promise to defend uh, the, the crown's interests, though they're not usually interested in making people that they have suspect loyalties of uh, fight for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they do is they, they get people to sign these loyalty oaths as kind of an affirmation of their acceptance of royal rule. Uh, and it's kind of a carrot. They hold out the prospect of returning to what they call kind of the king's peace, um, which is reconnecting to the old British empire, getting back kind of that access to trade routes, uh, getting back access to royal courts, the ability to sue and, and reclaim property and debts, um, kind of getting back all of these old connections to the British empire. Uh, and for a lot of people, especially people living in urban centers, this was attractive. These were people who made, a lot of them made their living based on uh, transatlantic trade um, and depended upon the nodes of the British Empire kind of for that livelihood. Um, and so for a lot, of, a lot of people kind of signed on thinking they would kind of get their, uh, get their lives back essentially, um, though it turned out to be very different. Well, how successful were the British in in the, I guess, in the in the best sense in their light, in achieving a king's peace or restoring civil government, and, you know, maybe we can look at, uh, for example, New York City and Savannah, which I think are uh, 
two of the critical places where where these experiments are taking place. Yeah, and I mean, they're they're um, New York and Savannah are great kind of compare contrast because they're they're really different in the ways that um, they succeed. Um, in New York, the British invade in the uh, late summer and fall of 1776. Uh, they seize. Long Island, Manhattan Island, Staten Island, kind of uh, the, the, what we now think of as the boroughs of New York City, um, as well as some of the surrounding area, but they're never able to kind of penetrate deeper into the country. Um, and so there exists this kind of no man's land, um, this, this kind of hard border in between revolutionary New York and British occupied New York. Mm -hmm. um, and because of this, the, the British are unwilling to kind of restore full civil government uh, to the areas they occupy. Um, instead, there's this kind of mix of military government led by uh, the commanding general of the army, uh, successively William Howe and then Sir Henry Clinton and Sir Guy Carleton, um, and the commandants of the city of New York itself, uh, who are responsible for kind of keeping order on the streets. Um, and they work with kind of a series of uh, a group of civilian former officials um, led by uh, Sir, uh, sorry, excuse me, um, Andrew Elliott, uh, mm -hmm. former customs collector, um, who is uh, given the title of uh, chief of police or chief magistrate of police or superintendent of police, depending on uh, which which source you read. Um, and he's kind of responsible for this civilian apparatus that then keeps order in the streets and reports back to the military with. Uh, uh, kind of offenders. Um, and in this way, they give civilians kind of a stake in the administration and, and actually provide, um, for example, kind of um, lodging for the poor and, and people who couldn't afford it, um, you know, based on uh, professions of loyalty and, and uh, um, adherence to the crown. Um, they confiscate uh, the estates and the houses of known what they would call traitors or revolutionaries, um, and uh, uh, rent those out to uh, loyalists or people who kind of adhere to them coming into the city. Um, and they, you know, and they employ a lot of people as street cleaners, as clerks, as um, rent collectors, and and so forth. Um, so there's this kind of weird civilian administration, um, but it never really has the the full force of law. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's only backed by the military, um, there's this idea that it could end at any time when the military comes out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, especially kind of poignant are the examples of Boston, uh, Newport, and Philadelphia, which the British Army does leave kind of before the war ends, um, and which um, loyalists who collaborated with the British or who helped the British um, end up kind of faring really poorly in. Uh, and you can address that to Savannah where the uh, uh, British do bring back the royal governor, uh, Sir James Wright. Um, they're actually able to conquer the entire province of Georgia uh, by the end of 1779, 1780. Um, and they're able to actually call uh, the colonial assembly back into session in uh, 1780. Um, and this is, you know, Savannah and, and later Charleston, where they attempt to, to do the same thing, though Charleston doesn't succeed as well. Um, you know, it's really kind of their best hope, their, their best hope to kind of restore and show that they're going to be a restored king's peace. Uh, and it does work for about a year, but... Again, when the British army marches north uh, out of the low country into North Carolina towards Yorktown, um, it kind of goes away. Um, the, the, uh, you get revolutionary guerrilla forces fighting in the back country uh, through the swamps um, and kind of these, these feuds between uh, people of different allegiances break out. Um, and uh, Wright is, is uh, at, you know, even though he tries his best as, as governor to kind of conciliate the situation, uh, is never able to kind of retain the power that, that he had previously. So even where civil government is kind of technically put in power, while the war is still raging, the military really is, is the ultimate kind of be all and end all. And as the the British government or the British army is trying to take these various cities and is in some sense successfully holding at least some of them, at least while they're sitting in there and, and not heading towards Yorktown, which uh, didn't end well for them. 
Uh, how are people, the people you spoke of earlier, sort of in this middle ground, hedging their bets, trying to figure out you know, how to survive, how are they, as you say in the book, uh, reinventing and also ruining themselves in the process? Well, a lot of them are doing really ingenious things. Um, you know, there, there's um, an innkeeper in uh, New York City who um, does this, runs this uh, kind of arbitrage scam with continental currency, um, where she, um, you know, she she keeps opens her house to prisoners of war uh, from the Continental Army, um, houses them, takes their rent in uh, continental dollars, which not a lot of landlords would do in, in occupied New York. Um, and then she uh, asks the military authorities for a pass to go outside of the lines, uh, crosses the river to New Jersey, uses that continental currency to buy a bunch of food, uh, comes back into New York and sells it at three or four times the price she paid for it um, in New York current, uh, British currency mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and pockets the difference. Um, so, and there's a lot of people who are kind of working these, these kind of angles, um, these kind of schemes uh, to enrich themselves. And in her case, she actually uh, breaks her way free of uh, an abusive husband who she's able to throw out of the house um, and break free from uh, because of this this kind of new source of power, this new source of income. Um, for other people, they are you know more fundamentally reinventing themselves. You know, one of the people I follow in the book is uh, an enslaved carpenter uh, and later sailor named Boston King. Mm -hmm. um, he's born on a plantation uh, outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he's a uh, again trained as a carpenter, a skilled trade. Uh, flees to the British lines. The British were offering freedom to the, the enslaved people of revolutionaries who fled uh, behind their lines and were willing to serve in the army. Uh, serves in uh, a British regiment as kind of an auxiliary or a um, grunt, kind of a worker. Um, then ends up uh, escaping to New York uh, where he marries another freed slave. Uh, works as a carpenter, a hairdresser, a, uh, a, a manservant, eventually sails in a whaleboat, um, and ends up kind of reinventing himself as a free person, ends up after the war leaving with the British and uh, living out the rest of his life in uh, Nova Scotia in a, in a free black uh, community. Um, and there's tons of people like this kind of that, that are, um, you know, totally kind of changing their circumstance uh, through, uh, through the occupation. That, that raises a question in my mind about source material. Uh, you know, in, in some ways it's easier to write about the big guys like Sir Henry Clinton or, you know, folks like that because they, they kept luminous papers, you know, George Washington, of course. Uh, but these, these middling folks, uh, these folks that you, that, you know, we don't often see or write about or people that you're tracking across large spaces through time. Where do you find these, some of these individuals? Uh, through a lot of digging. Um, a lot of it was was kind of going to historical societies in these spots and just kind of digging through uh, people's papers for these years um, and, and seeing what they had. Um, and part of the reason for that is, is, again, kind of going back to the beginning of our conversation, some of these people kind of went to efforts uh, to hide the extent of their activities during the, the occupation. Uh, one of the stories I, I found most fascinating was that of uh, Mary Almy, uh, who was uh, the owner of a boarding house in, in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, and Almy was kind of a diehard loyalist, even mm -hmm. though her husband, Captain Benjamin Almy, served in the, the Continental Artillery. Uh, she wrote a series of, of letters to him during the, the Battle of Rhode Island, um, where uh, he was actually commanding a unit that was attacking Newport. Um, and uh, she writes these these kind of furious letters saying like, you know, I hope the, the Continental Army burns in hell and its commander, you know, dies a horrible death. And that when I see you again, you're being marched through the streets as a prisoner of war. Uh, but then, you know, she she hides that like she, she kind of, you know, once Newport reverts to to revolutionary rule, once the British evacuate um, in October of 1779, she takes this this kind of bundle of unsent letters. <clears throat> 
uh, hands them to a good friend of hers and says, you know, hide these, you know, until at long after I'm dead. Um, and actually, she continues to operate this boarding house uh, with her with her husband uh, well into the 1790s and even has a, a kind of maybe a legendary Washington connection where George Washington apparently stays at this at this house uh, when he comes through Newport in, uh, in the 1790s. Um, and uh, the Newport Historical Society has a blanket that they they say belong that you know Washington slept on there, um, but uh, you know that but you know they don't find these these papers of hers until 1845 1850 when her grandchildren are going through the attic and they find you know oh my God Grandma was you know a loyalist, um, so a lot of people you know went to went to great lengths to hide their their activities during this period which made kind of hunting for their stories um, that more that much more challenging and rewarding when when we could find them. God, that's that's amazing. I mean, it's also a good example of always look in grandma's basement because something yeah. cool at the end. <laughs> Absolutely. It's also a concrete example of, you know, how the stress or how the occupation of the war put stress on individuals and families. And, you know, I was uh, we, we made a joke about it being cold earlier because it's winter. Uh, and I was outside the other day chopping down some trees and then splitting logs uh, with my mighty axe. And so I was thinking about that after, when I was reading your book and you have a, a really wonderful discussion about the stress that the occupation puts on the natural landscape and the environment and the actual, the ways in which people heated their homes, um, built shelters, um, fed themselves. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, those stresses? Yeah, I mean, the army was an extraordinary drain on resources um, in these cities. Uh, and especially when you consider that um, these places were not set up for large kind of influxes of population. Uh, sure. The largest city in colonial America, uh, Philadelphia, had about 25,000 people living it during peacetime. Um, and that was with kind of trade routes open from the countryside um, and uh, took an incredible amount of uh, wood, of food, of um, fuel to actually heat um, and keep these people alive. And the British army, you know, for example, when it comes into New York, uh, comes in with about 35,000 troops. Um, you know, in, in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, they come in with uh, 8,000. Um, that almost doubles the, the pre-war population of about 10,000 living on, uh, on Aquidneck Island. Um, and by the end of the, uh, the first year of the occupation of, of Rhode Island, uh, they've cut down every single tree on uh, Aquidneck Island. Um, and they're beginning to tear down fences and outbuildings and barns and actually even to send uh, armed ships uh, to go and raid the Connecticut coast uh, for lumber. Um, and even as far away as Long Island. Um, you see this also with prices for food and, uh, uh, and shelter. Um, you know, there, there's tons of complaints, even from well-off people in New York City, um, that uh, prices for rents are, are sky high. Um, a lot of this has to do with the, the, there was a fire at the beginning of the occupation that burned about a third of uh, the homes in the city. Uh, but this happens pretty much everywhere the British go because, um, you know, there's so many soldiers that, that need to be housed and fed and uh, sheltered that get priority over uh, the local population in, uh, um, in a lot of places. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's um, you know, there's accounts of, uh, people going hungry and and even kind of freezing to death on the streets um, in Newport. Uh, you know the winter of 17, uh, 77, 78 was we know by uh, kind of climate science one of the the coldest of the second half of the eighteenth century. Um, and we have accounts of of people freezing to death uh, and actually even burning animal fat and and other things you know in order to to try to survive. Um, in New York City, the price of regular brown bread, um, you know, ordinary stuff goes up by about five times, um, you know, yeah. it's pre-war uh, it's, it's pre um, high. Um, and this is kind of despite British efforts to, uh, to, to kind of protect these, these populations. Um, so yeah, there's, there's really kind of dire, uh, dire straits for a lot of people living in these towns. To what extent were they able to restart commerce, especially when you know, the British take places like New York or Savannah, where they have a, a little more stable control of Charleston? Are they able to resupply themselves and to uh, actually put back into place some kind of market economy? 
in a sense, yes and no. So they're they're able to bring in a lot of what we might today think of as luxuries, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, for example, there's a, a merchant in Newport, Rhode Island, Stephen Ayrault, uh, who the day after the British land starts writing to his suppliers in Birmingham and and uh, Sheffield, um, saying, you know, send me hardware, send me uh, silverware, send me you know ceramics, uh, send me all of the the stuff because there's this desire for British manufactured goods that people haven't been able to get since the, the outbreak of uh, uh, the imperial crisis. Um, and there's, there's a great deal of, you know, a lot of these goods that are selling very cheaply in a lot of these cities, um, just because there's been a supply built up uh, in England during the, the kind of uh, intervening period. Um, and there's a lot of demand from American merchants to, to kind of sell it. So, you know, if you're in the market for a set of uh, really nice Wedgwood Queensware, um, you know, occupied New York might be your place. Um, but at the same time, they're not really able to connect to the economy, the, the local economies. They're not really able to reconnect these food supplies, these these kind of uh, fuel supplies that kept the cities going on, on kind of a day to day basis. Um, you know, and, and the British army, you know, goes so far as to even try to ship in food from Ireland, um, which, you know, spoils on the way and, and, you know, never really works, but they, they ship in, they try to ship, you know, dried, uh, dried grain, they try to ship, uh, coal to, to heat fires, you know, and it, it just never really works. Well, that's fascinating. And uh, just to our audience out there, we'll be coming to your questions here in just a minute. So please do uh, get them in if you haven't already. And feel free over the rest of the evening to continue posting questions if, the, if they come to mind. Don, a little bit ago, you mentioned the fact that the experience of occupation, um, in a sense, eroded whatever trappings of loyalty many colonists felt for George III and his government, uh, just by the virtue of experiencing and going through those hardships. Can you tell us more about that process? What was it uh, sort of all at once uh, that uh, some people decided that enough was enough, or was it kind of a slow burn that by 1783, when peace comes, they decided that they were not going to go into exile, but stay in the new United States? It's much more of a slow burn, and, and I, I kind of compare it to muscle memory almost. Huh. Um, so what a lot of these people, even if they, they were you know, the, had this, this utmost loyalty to the crown, uh, the beginning of the occupation, uh, because of the hardships, because of the, the uh, strain that the British army puts on these communities, uh, they're forced to kind of break the law to uh, turn to illicit means uh, in order to survive. Uh, so for example, the um, Brindley family of Rhode Island, which has branches in, in Boston and New York, um, is constantly kind of smuggling food and, and resources to one another uh, across enemy lines. Um, you know, one brother in revolutionary Newport, one brother in um, occupied New York, one brother in, in Boston. You know, they're constantly writing to each other and, and sending each other food and, and, other th and money and, and other things um, kind of illicitly, um, you know, under, um, under the nose of the British. Um, the same thing is happening in, in the South. You see people kind of um, keeping ties to revolutionary friends, neighbors, uh, relatives, um, not necessarily out of ideological uh, reasons, but for practical reasons, just mm -hmm. because that's how they, they can survive. And, and also kind of vice versa, um, you know, people in revolutionary held areas kind of keeping ties to occup British occupied areas um, in order to uh, to, to save that. Um, so I think, you know, by having to kind of constantly undermine these, these governments, um, you know, the, these occupation regimes, um, it erodes their authority. It, it, you know, it erodes the idea that, you know, the king can actually, um, you know, the king's forces, I should say, not the king personally, but the king's forces can uh, actually meet the needs of, of the population. Um, so while it doesn't necessarily turn people into, you know, stalwart revolutionaries, mm -hmm. it at least gives them kind of this, this uh, alienation from royal government uh, that didn't necessarily exist before, uh, before the war. Well, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And just before we turn to audience questions, I, I do want to note that you did teach two classes today. So thank you very much for being here with us. And I want to close my portion of the, of the conversation by asking you, what do you often tell your students is the most important thing they ought to know about 
the occupation, or actually maybe even better, what surprised you most about this project when you were researching it? That's a great question. What surprised me most about the, the project and uh, the occupations was um, really kind of the the amount of good faith people put into, um, you know, actually making society work under under British occupation and, and the, um, you know, the, the we often kind of think of, you know, oh yeah, like when the military comes, it's, it's this kind of, you know, catch all or, or, you know, um, this, this, uh, dire situation where, where people are kind of closeted and, you know, a lot of people like, you know, I, I feel like this category of in between Patriot and loyalists, this category of disaffected, this category of people that kind of fence sit or go either ways, they, they get a bad rap in, uh, you know, early histories and, and in modern histories. Um, and I think it's undeserved. I think a lot of these people, you know, held strong political opinions, um, but they didn't necessarily have the luxury of acting on them. They didn't necessarily, you know, and, and I mean, one of the, one of the, you know, the best sources I found was this book of poems from a, a woman in New York um, who was uh, Hannah Lawrence, um, who was a Quaker, uh, uh, daughter of a Quaker merchant, who in her poetry was vehemently pro-revolutionary. She wrote these these romantic couplets about you know revolutionary heroes and Republican virtue, um, and then she goes and marries a British soldier, um, <laughs> and ends up you know living in and uh, moving to uh, to British Canada, um, and you know it's it's the, the that kind of disconnect is is really fascinating to me, and it doesn't mean that you know she didn't hold deep beliefs. Um, you know, she obviously did, but again, you know, in her day-to-day -day life, she didn't have the luxury of, of acting upon them. Uh, and I think that shows us a lot of, of, you know, what happens during kind of these revolutionary upheavals. Yeah, yeah. Well, Don, this has been great. I'm, uh, thanks very much for, for talking with me. Now let's talk to the audience. We've got a, a question coming in about uh, the transition of capital cities from, you know, places like uh, Philly to Harrisburg and Charleston to Columbia. And Adams is asking, you know, to what extent, if any, did the occupation of these cities uh, lead to the uh, the removal of these capitals uh, to other places in these states? That's a really interesting question. I, I've never I've never really thought of it that way. Um, you know, the traditional narrative is is that it's it's kind of this east versus west, you know, frontier versus versus establishment that leads to kind of the movement of capitals. Um, you know, from like yeah, I mean, Philly to, to Harrisburg, Charleston to Columbia, Savannah to Atlanta. Um, you know, places like that. Um, but occupation, you know, may may have had something to do with it as well. Um, you know, again, I, I am not sure on the timing of that, so I'll, I'll have to punt on that question to, to someone who might know it any better. But that's that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you, Adam. There's your research topic, so let's get to it. <laughs> uh, we've got a question coming in about uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, and, and its neighbors, Yorktown and, and Jamestown. And Cynthia is asking, uh, uh, and she's curious about the struggles that these cities face to hold off any Brit British occupation as long as they could. Yeah, um, and I mean, you could argue that that you know Yorktown does get occupied uh, in the uh, at the end of the war by uh, by Cornwallis for about uh, for about two months, um, and um, um, actually Norfolk, uh, Virginia, ends up uh, occupied at the very beginning of the war and um, basically burned by uh, uh, Patriot leaders in order to prevent its uh, its use as a base um, by Governor Dunmore. Um, but really, I mean, the, the Chesapeake towns uh, tended to be too small, really, for, for the British to, to worry much about. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons, and I mentioned this in the book as well, that, um, you know, it's not a coincidence that the six cities that, uh, that I'm talking about, Boston, uh, New York, Newport, Philadelphia, Savannah, and Charleston, uh, were the biggest cities in, in colonial North America and the most important kind of economically. Um, and uh, and the most important is kind of strategically. Uh, and Williamsburg, you know, Yorktown, Jamestown uh, just weren't, you know, kind of on that map of, of kind of an imperial, uh, uh, from an imperial standpoint. Um, they did face raids, um, you know, at various points in the war. And again, Yorktown gets occupied by, by Cornwallis's troops, um, but really only kind of circumstantially, only when Cornwallis is kind of seeking an escape um, back to New York. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, Again, yeah, they're they're just not as important, kind of economically, to to the the transatlantic trade. 
you know, that makes that makes sense. Well, thank you, Cynthia, very much. Our next question is actually looking at uh, whether or not any of the cities occupied by the British were what you would regard as a failure. I guess, is Boston such an example and what were some common themes that we saw in these various places? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they all fail uh, in, in the end, um, you know, because they, they all get returned to uh, the United States. Um, the, the British actually, when they negotiate for peace, um, there is a movement uh, because at the end of the, even after the Battle of Yorktown, uh, the British hold New York, Savannah, and Charleston. Um, and there is actually a directive by um, the, the ministry to save New York, uh, to keep it as kind of an American Gibraltar or a, a, you know, a trading outpost um, to which the, the British can um, keep some of their economic clout uh, in North America um, and, and kind of station their navy and, and kind of have a strategic uh, holdout. Um, but really, you know, the, the populations of all of these cities turn against the British by mm -hmm. the end of the war. Um, they they don't, um, you know, by, by the end of the war, even kind of the, the people who had been the most excited about British rule at the beginning of the occupation of New York, um, you know, they're they're exhausted. They're they're tired. They're they're ready to make peace with uh, the revolutionary governments. Um, I mean, even William Smith Jr., one of these these kind of um, you know really cantankerous loyalists, uh, basically says enough is enough. Like you know, the population here won't follow you if if you try to hold New York as as kind of an American uh, Gibraltar or a, or a British post um, in North America. Um, and uh, they ultimately kind of have to give it up uh, because the population is turned against them. Um, so you know, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think the the common theme is is that they just kind of collapse, uh, mm -hmm. you know, after British military defeat. I, this question does make me wonder, though, about what lessons the British learned in various cities during the over the course of occupations and the extent to which, you know, they say, you know, for example, applied lessons they may have learned in Boston to New York or Savannah or Charleston or places like that. Yeah, um, they, they do kind of, it does evolve over the course of the war. Um, you know, the, the police system that they create in New York uh, gets replicated in Philadelphia, in Savannah, in Charleston. Um, and I believe in Newport, though the records of Newport's occupation uh, sank to the bottom of the sea uh, when the British evacuated and, and the ship carrying the, the town records uh, sank. Um, but... Um, yeah, no, the, these police systems evolve. Um, in Charleston, uh, former Attorney General um, James Simpson creates this really elaborate plan for different districts and intendancies of police um, and even kind of um, ideological indoctrination of, uh, uh, of the population. Um, but it, it again, it never really takes hold and largely mm -hmm. it's it's not necessarily the fault of um, these these officials. It's it's mostly kind of these military officers who are unwilling to kind of put um, conciliation in front of, of military victory. Well, one of the tools at their disposal is confiscation. Actually, both revolutionary regimes and and the British authorities use this tool. In in what ways are they using properties confiscation as a kind of a carrot and stick as a, as a means to entice people to one side or the other? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of the things, in, I mean, especially apparent in the occupied South in, in South Carolina and Georgia, um, the British seize uh, a large number of plantations and a large number of uh, enslaved people uh, when they initially invade Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, and they kind of dole these out um, as alternately kind of rewards to people who return to their loyalty. And they're able to kind of reclaim their property or reclaim in some cases their, their enslaved people. Um, and uh, even for some people who, you know, stuck with the crown even you know before the the occupation uh they're gifted they're they're kind of given the land of uh former revolutionaries they're given the enslaved people to kind of do what they will uh with um during this this period um alternately the the police courts in new york in um charleston uh, have the power to kind of take away property, to, to, to agitate, um, you know, to, to seize land and to seize uh, um, 
material and goods. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, of kind of using people's property uh, and people's wealth as, as a way to kind of entice or uh, punish them uh, alternatively. Well, speaking of, uh, of taking territory, uh, we've got a question coming in here about how far inland the British managed to occupy uh, the country during the war. Uh, it depends on the region. Uh, in uh, in most of the places that, that I'm looking at, they didn't go in that much further than uh, than the territory of the actual cities. Uh, so in Boston, they never really controlled uh, beyond. Uh, in by Boston's a great example. They never really controlled beyond the auspices of the city itself. Mm -hmm. uh, in Philadelphia, ex as well, they they controlled the city and uh, some of kind of the the what we what we think of as kind of the inner inner suburbs, um, but um, but the lines were, were pretty um, pretty narrow. Um, in the South, it's a little bit like more um, all encompassing. Um, they occupied Georgia uh, up to Augusta. Uh, so they got pretty far into uh, into Western Georgia. They occupied South Carolina as far back as, as 96, which was a, a frontier settlement. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, or sorry, South Carolina as far back as 96, um, and uh, were able to kind of, um, at certain points, exercise control over those entire states. Um, so it really varied uh, from, from place to place. Um, and then there were places that, you know, both sides claimed. Um, a lot of kind of the regions around New York City uh, you know, for about a hundred miles uh, in either direction, um, were kind of no man's land. Were, were places where um, militias, either loyal to the king or loyal to the revolutionaries, um, kind of fought one another for control, um, and uh, and neither side really had a, a clear advantage. Uh, we have a question coming in about a disaffection uh, amongst the citizens, and and actually, I want to build on what you just said because I'm I'm wondering. Uh, the, uh, the you know when rebel and uh, British armies were contesting these no man lands you know to what extent did that lead to either disaffection or it le did lead it or did it lead people to side with one uh, uh, government or the other? I think both. Um, you know I, I think there were there were a certain amount of people who were willing to side which with that, with whichever side was stronger or looked more ready to uh, to win the war mm -hmm. um, you know and, and I found um, you know uh, correspondences uh, between family members in, in different places where they say you know all right maybe next month is the time to jump ship and and come over to the revolutionary side or you know maybe um, you know in a couple months if they win this battle we should uh, switch to to the crown um, so there's uh, there's a lot of, of kind of fence swapping uh, or, or fence uh, uh, side swapping in these uh, in these in these areas. Um, in terms of uh, disaffection, there's also a lot of that. There's a lot of people who kind of are um, kind of militantly anti both sides. And, and um, you know, I, I could draw the comparison to the English Civil War, mm -hmm. um, where there are these these groups called kind of clubmen who would defend their towns against uh, both the royalists and the parliamentary forces. Um, and you see that more in kind of the backcountry of the Carolinas in Georgia. Um, they're what they call kind of these people beyond the mountains, um, these, these Tennesseans and Kentuckians um, who just kind of want to defend their settlements and, and um, you know, will attack pretty much anyone who, who comes through their region. Um, so I, I'd say, yeah, those are, um, there's definitely disaffection there. Uh, in terms of the question, were the experiences of, of the disaffected comparable in occup different occupied cities? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there are, you know, what, what I try to do in the book is, is draw kind of common threads as much as I can. Um, and in each city, there's kind of an arc. There, there's a hopefulness kind of at the beginning when the British arrive, at least among a lot of the population that they'll be reconnected to the British Empire, um, that things will get more peaceful, that this is kind of the beginning of the end of, of their travails. Uh, and then there's this kind of period of deprivation and, and kind of 
the hardship of military rule. And, and the other thing that occurs is, is violence. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, militaries and, and the British army in particular was a very violent society. And there's assaults, there's rapes, there's murders, uh, there are duels. Um, you know, there's all kinds of, of violence in these in these cities. So, I mean, that experience is, is common to, to all six. Um, you know, there are certain things in, in some cities that set people off that don't in others. I mean, one of the things that the Bostonians are constantly complaining about is the British soldiers cursing um, and not respecting the Sabbath on Sundays um, and, and, you know, not, not letting them go into their churches. Uh, you know, one of the things that the um, Carolinians are always complaining about is, you know, how the British are uh, free with uh, enslaved people, and that they're they're allowing blacks to kind of um, have more liberties than than they're used to, um, you know. So there are regional differences and cultural differences like that, but um, but there are a lot of common experiences. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, we won't swear on the program this evening. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've got one final question here from uh, from Niles, and and actually I want to build on his question a little bit. He's asking about. Uh, the prominent split between Benjamin Franklin and his son William, who was the last royal governor of New Jersey, a concrete example of a really powerful split between a loyalist and a revolutionary family. I, I, I want to build on that by also asking about the long-lasting effects of occupation in the post-war period. Uh, what did it mean for people who had been occupied or who had been divided and went into exile? What, what kind of lasting effects did that occupation have on their lives? It's a great question, and I mean, I, I can't think of a, as many notable splits as as the Franklins, um, but there were definitely a lot of a lot of families that were divided this way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the Brindley family that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, uh, about half of them end up in Nova Scotia um, and England, uh, with the other half remaining in in Rhode Island. Um, and both sides prosper and continue to kind of correspond. Um, it's just that you know one side can't come back um, under under kind of penalty of, of um, you know, execution. Um, so there's a lot of these these splits. And again, the, the Franklins, you know, with, with uh, Benjamin Franklin's son, the former royal governor of New Jersey, uh, going into exile, whereas as uh, Franklin himself, you know, becoming a prominent citizen. Um, and the experience of occupation does hang over a lot of, a lot of people, but in a certain way, they're they're able to kind of sweep it under the rug, and they're able to kind of forget it. And there's this uh, again, kind of going back to the beginning of conver the car conversation. Um, there is kind of a permissiveness in the early republic, or a willingness to forget a lot of the complexities, a lot of kind of the nuances of the wartime experience. Um, and one of the examples I, I, of that is, um, you know, someone that a lot of historians of the early Republic are familiar with, uh, Tench Cox, who was a political economist, um, you know, in the Department of the Treasury under uh, both the Washington and Jefferson administrations. Um, and in his younger life, he was a diehard loyalist. Um, you know, he lived and occupied Philadelphia, uh, married the daughter of of a prominent loyalist family, um, you know, basically made his money kind of profiteering off of the occupation, uh, obtaining licenses to sell goods to the British West Indies and import uh, stuff from New York and the Caribbean to Philadelphia. Um, but he kind of is one of these people who switches sides at the right time. Uh, when he gets word that the British are getting ready to evacuate, he uh, writes to relatives outside of the town. He sneaks out of Philadelphia about a week before the British leave and signs an oath of loyalty to the revolutionary state of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, he comes back, he writes his contacts in New York that, you know, he's basically breaking contact with them. And, you know, he's he writes that he's willing to be the most perfect American if they'll accept him. Um, and, um, you know, he's able to make a career um, you know, in politics, even in the early Republic, he's elected to the Congress of the Confederation in the 1780s, um, you know, serves in, in the Treasury Department in the 1790s and 1800s. Uh, and this comes up every now and again when he's running for office or when he's, you know, uh, um, you know, in public view, but it's almost treated as, as kind of a youthful indiscretion. You know, his defenders are kind of like, you know, you can't blame him for that. He was only 20. You know, you can't blame him for that. It was war. And so there's this this kind of, you know, 
let's let's kind of like let bygones be bygones. And I think part of that is everyone had something like that that they did during the war that they wouldn't want brought out. And so his critics, you know, are never able to kind of get any traction because there's this this kind of forgive and forget mentality. Oh, sure. I have to say, I saw, you know, I know Tinch Cox from the early Republic context. So, and I really hadn't read much about his life before you know, the 1790s. So he showed up in your book and I'm like, what the heck is he doing there? <laughs> so, and it was, a, it was a great concrete example of, of, of the ways in which I think you, as you talked in the book, people were reinventing themselves either during the war or even after. Absolutely, absolutely. And he's another one of these that uh, ended up mutilating his account books. Um, you know, if you, if you look at his his records of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, uh, when they open again, um, you know, you, you, you can see that that portions of his his account books and his letter books are just ripped out from from during the occupation. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's on the one hand, really frustrating, but on the other, like really interesting to see kind of the the way people reshaped their lives. Yeah, that's very telling. Well, Don, this has been fantastic. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, speaking of travel, when we're able to travel again, you're back down this way. Let's occupy a table at a pub. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've, really, I've really enjoyed our time together. Uh, I want to thank you. Um, I want to thank our audience for your terrific questions. Thanks so much for tuning in to all of uh, all of you out there. Thanks also to Sam Snyder and uh, Jeanette Patrick for behind the scenes working their magic as usual. Uh, Don, take care and hope to see you soon. And everyone else, have a good evening and good night and uh, good luck. Thank you so much. It's been uh, been a pleasure.